Encur I, I'm glad that you did. I encourage everyone else uh, tonight, maybe go and read the Song of Songs and uh, consider for yourself some of the things that it says. Uh, <clears throat> again, uh, as he pointed out, the, the, the imagery is not really visual uh, because he talks about her neck looking like a strong tower, you know, and, and her hair looking like flocks of sheep. And so it doesn't uh, translate very well into our visually oriented uh, uh, the way that we learn things, the way that we do things nowadays, but there are descriptions that hopefully express the love that, uh, that he feels for her and, of course, that she feels for him. Um, let's jump right in and, and look at how we see Jesus through the Song of Songs. I think that uh, as you listen to the video and, and notice there, uh, the idea of pointing back to the Garden of Eden and uh, the idea of a relationship untainted by sin, uh, that is exactly uh, where we would go with this to recognize the relationship uh, between Christ and his church that I think is beautifully expressed here in the Song of Songs. First, we'll look at chapter two, starting in verse uh, eight, and uh, we'll read through verse 13. I'm reading, of course, from the New Living Translation. It says, Ah, oh, I hear my lover coming. He's leaping over the mountains, bounding over the hills. My lover is like a swift gazelle or a young stag. Look, there he is behind the wall, looking through the window, peering into the room. My lover said to me, Rise up, my darling. Come away with me, my fair one. Look, the winter is past and the rains are over and gone. The flowers are springing up. The season of singing birds has come and the cooing of turtle doves fills the air. The fig leaves are forming young fruit and the fragrant grapevines are blossoming. Rise up, my darling. Come away with me, my fair one. So as we consider this passage, it, it's uh, expressing the excitement a uh, young woman has looking forward to the arrival of her beloved, of course. It's a glimpse into our anticipation for the coming of Christ. Uh, the idea of our, uh, our looking forward to and our hope for the, the King of Kings, the Savior, Jesus, to arrive to take us to our heavenly home to be with him forever and ever. You know, in Matthew chapter 25, starting in verse 1, uh, Jesus uses a parable to express this very principle, this thought. Uh, read along with me, Matthew 25. Jesus uh, says, The kingdom of heaven, it'll be like ten bridesmaids who took their lamps and they went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The five who were foolish, they didn't take enough oil for their lamps. But the other five, they were wise enough to take extra oil. And when the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and they fell asleep. At midnight, they were roused by the shout, Look, the bridegroom is coming. Come out and meet him. All the bridesmaids got up and prepared their lamps. Then the five foolish ones asked the others, Please give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. But the others replied, We don't have enough for us and for you. You should go to a shop and buy some for yourselves. But while they were gone to buy oil, the bridegroom came. And then those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was locked. Later, when the other five bridesmaids returned, they stood outside calling, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he called back, believe me, I don't know you. So you too must keep watch, for you do not know the day or the hour of my return. See, Jesus, uh, I think more often uh, than any other uh, example, he uses the marriage relationship. Of course, the Holy Spirit does the same through uh, uh, inspiring Paul to write uh, in Ephesians 5, uh, showing us the relationship between Christ and his church. Uh, the, the idea of a bride and a groom anticipating uh, to get, uh, being together, anticipating one another's presence and the uh, excitement and the, uh, the gladness and the happiness, the joy that fills the hearts of those who are anticipating that uh, reunion. And so uh, this is the same idea here. And Jesus tells us through this story, of course, the point being to be prepared to live a life that brings glory and honor to God, to live a life uh, that is, is, is understanding of the spiritual way that Christ guides us every day through the Word, that we can read the Bible, that we can uh, know and, and never have to be ashamed, uh, yet always dividing the Word of God, understanding it, and then putting it to practice in our life. It's one thing to read the Bible. It's a very different thing to actually live it out, to actually put it into practice, to love 
enemies, uh, to, to do good to those her, who persecute you, to be a sacrificial, loving person as Jesus set an example for us to be. It's a, 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 a high calling and a serious challenge for anyone as we live in this world. Over in Revelation 19 and uh, starting verse 7, it says, Let us be glad and rejoice. Let us give honor to him. For the time has come for the wedding feast of the Lamb. And his bride has prepared herself. She's been given the finest of pure white linen to wear. For the fine linen represents the good deeds of God's holy people. Here at, at the end of the, uh, of the inspired word in Revelation 19, he says this uh, wedding feast, back to the same imagery that Jesus used in the, the parable of those ten virgins. He says here's a wedding feast for the lamb. His bride has what? Prepared herself. And this is something that we should be serious about, preparing ourselves for the coming of the Lord. As Jesus said in Matthew 25, we don't know when, we don't know what time, but surely he is coming. He will come. And when he comes, he expects to find his bride, the church, waiting for him, anticipating his arrival, looking forward even. Uh, First John tells us that we're anticipating and looking forward to his arrival. What a wonderful view that will be to see Jesus coming in the clouds in the air. The great shout that we have heard prophesied about his return. That uh, as 1 Thessalonians tells us, we will rise and meet him in the air. And thus we will always be with the Lord. <clears throat> in 2 Peter chapter 3, in verse 8. Uh, We have this passage, and it's a popular one that we recognize often because it implores us to live as we should. But read along with me, 2 Peter chapter 3. It says, But you must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord isn't really being slow about His promise, as some people think. No, He's being patient for your sake. He doesn't want anyone to be destroyed, but He wants everyone to repent. But the day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief. And then those heavens, they will pass away with a terrible noise. And the very elements themselves will disappear in fire. And the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. Since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, what holy and godly lives should you live? Looking forward to the day of God? Even hurrying it along? On that day, he will set the heavens on fire and the elements will melt away in the flames. Again, an imploring to be ready, an imploring to get ready, to recognize that the day is imminent, that we uh, live as the Christians that we read about in the New Testament lived in the last days. Days that we should be anticipating and looking forward to the coming of Jesus Christ, a a, a union that will come between a, a bridegroom and his bride, a wedding feast that you've been invited to, that everyone in the world, because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, everyone's invited to. But as Jesus taught, only those who are prepared are gonna go in. Only those who are prepared, only those who have recognized the truth of who Jesus is and then live their lives in accordance with his teaching. Still in first, well, over in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6, it says, So be truly glad. There's a wonderful joy ahead of you. Even though you must endure many trials during this time, these trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. Though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. You love him even though you've never seen him. Though you do not see him now, you trust him. And you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. The reward for trusting him will be the salvation of your souls. I think that's an encouragement as we read in the Song of Songs, an encouragement to be faithful, an encouragement to look forward to the coming of Christ, an encouragement to anticipate a great day of uh, union with our Savior and being with Him for all eternity. Uh, Next, I'd like for us to look at uh, chapter 4 and verses 1 through 10. Chapter 4, verses 1 through 10, and uh, consider uh, a few things there. Read along with me. We'll start in, uh, in verse 1. 
You are beautiful, my darling, beyond words. Your eyes are like doves behind your veil. Your hair, it falls in waves like a flock of goats winding down the slopes of Gilead. Your teeth are as white as sheep, recently shorn and freshly washed. You enjoy this, uh, <laughs> this uh, imagery, I guess. Um, freshly washed. Your smile is flawless, each tooth matched with its twin. Your lips are like scarlet ribbon. Your mouth is inviting. Your cheeks are like rosy pomegranates behind your veil. Your neck is as, a beautiful, is as beautiful as the Tower of David, jeweled with the shields of a thousand heroes. <clears throat> he goes on, verse 6. Before the dawn breezes blow and the night uh, shadows flee, I will hurry to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of frankincense. You are altogether beautiful, my darling, beautiful in every way. Come with me from Lebanon, my bride. Come with me from Lebanon and down to Mount Amana, uh, and from the peaks of Sinar to Hermon, where the lions have their dens and the leopards live among the hills. You have captured my heart, my treasure, my bride. You hold it hostage with one glance of your eyes, with a single jewel of your necklace. Your love delights me, my treasure, my bride. Your love is better than wine, your perfume more fragrant than spices. Here, uh, this great description of, uh, of his beloved, as we, uh, as we read along with him, we see that he gains so much joy from her presence, from knowing who she is and from uh, spending time with her and being able to enjoy her, her beauty uh, that God surely has blessed her with. Uh, what a great description of <clears throat> the, uh, the passion that God feels towards his people. Now, I know I see some of you chuckling out there as you're reading some of these passages in uh, the Song of Songs. But just remember, as we said at the beginning, when you think spiritually, when you plug these into the spiritual aspect of God's deep love, what he uses is this marriage relationship to express to us his deep desire for us. He's passionate about you. He's passionate about his church, his bride. And, and this primary symbolism in the, the whole Bible that describes God's love for his people is the marriage relationship, a passionate and a sacrificial love that we can enjoy and experience in this life, a way that we can learn more about who our creator is and what he wants for us. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 5, starting in verse 21. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. He says, And further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And then he's going to explain what that means. He says, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Because of your faith in Christ, because of your devotion to Him, now this is how you're going to treat one another. Specifically now, he's going to talk to wives. He says, For the wives... This means submitting to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of his wife as Christ is the head of the church. He's the savior of the body, the church. As the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. And then he says, for the husbands, remember what the, the premise is, uh, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for the church to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually is showing love for himself. No one ever hated his own body, but feeds it and cares for it, just as Christ cares for the church. And we are members of his body. As the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united as one. This is a great mystery. Now listen carefully to verse 32 and 33. This is a great mystery, but is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. So again, I say each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Now these instructions are, are wonderful. These instructions are, are to guide us in our marriages. They're to help us treasure our marriages. They're to help us understand what love is. And what God's teaching us here is he's saying, look, your marriage is actually an illustration. 
This marriage that, that uh, you know, we recognize is the second most important decision we're ever going to make. Our first, of course, being following Jesus Christ. But the second most important decision in this life is who we're going to marry, who we're going to spend the rest of our life with. And, and especially for those of us in this room who are not married yet, our young folks, I want to encourage you. These are instructions that you should listen carefully to, to recognize that God is going to use marriage to teach you about his love for you. And the deep love that you feel, that you understand uh, between uh, a husband and a wife. This is to illustrate, this is to show us God's deep love for you and for me, for his church. That's the point behind marriage. And so when we approach marriage, we should approach it with a, a reverence, with an understanding that this is something God is using to guide me closer to him. This is a, a relationship that's real and it's wonderful. And yet all and everything about our relationship is teaching us more about him. You know, as you consider the different things that uh, Paul is inspired to say to husbands, he tells us that the husband is to be uh, a type of savior, a type of savior, just as Christ is the savior of the church, that a husband is a type of savior for his wife, for his family. It means that uh, we are, are there for them, that we make sure that their needs are met. This is what a savior does, isn't it? He also goes on and tells us that we should be a type of sacrifice. Just as Christ was the sacrifice and is the sacrifice for the church, husbands are to sacrifice for our wives. In our uh, premarital counseling that some of you have enjoyed being in with me, uh, we always talk about this and we say, you know, if uh, we've only got enough money for one person to eat, that means she's the one who gets to eat. Okay, because the husband is the one who will sacrifice according to what the teaching is here in the Bible. The husband makes sacrifice for his wife, for his bride. And this is a training to help us understand what God has done and how he sacrifices for his bride, the church. Yeah, we're to serve as a type of savior, a type of sacrifice, but also as a type of sanctifier, a type of sanctifier. Now, ladies, I'd encourage you, you should hold your husbands to this high standard. This is an excellent standard, and it is one that each of them are capable of living up to. Sorry, guys. We're capable of living up to this standard of being a sanctifier. You know, on Sunday mornings when I hold up my cell phone and I say, now use this later on in the week for a family devotional. Go back and rehash some of the things we talk about. But you don't have to just look at the sermons that we've uh, preached and that we've studied here. Uh, you can have your own Bible studies. There's so many resources right at your fingertips, right here in your Bible, just to open it up, to read some passages together. This is what sanctification is all about. Studying together, building one another up, listening carefully to what God says, and then making sure our families are growing closer to him. The fact is, and we all recognize it, if we're not growing towards something, we're actually going away from it. Jesus said, either you're gathering with me or you're scattering. There's no middle ground. There's no gray area. Either I'm helping my family get closer to Christ or by doing nothing, I'm pushing them further away. Either I'm getting closer to Jesus and farther from sin or I'm getting closer to sin and farther from Jesus. And so husbands, fathers, Let's be sanctifiers. Just as Jesus sanctifies his church by expressing his love to us, even in a, a book like the Song of Songs, expressing his love to us, we must now carry on that sanctification in our own families, studying, praying, singing, spending time with God as a family that our family, our, our wives, might be sanctified in Christ. Yeah, over in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11 also, I'd like to take a look at that one in reference to this uh, uh, chapter in the Song of Psalms. <clears throat> it says, I hope you'll put up with a little more of my foolishness. Please bear with me, for I'm jealous for you with the jealousy of God himself. I promised you as a pure bride to one husband, Christ. But I fear that somehow your pure and undivided devotion to Christ will be corrupted just as Eve was deceived by the cunning ways of the serpent, you happily put up with whatever anyone tells you, even if they preach a different Jesus than the one we preach, or a different kind of spirit than the one that you've received, or a different kind of gospel than the one you believe. Some versions say, uh, through the simplicity of the gospel, sometimes 
our hearts get turned away and we look for something maybe uh, more complicated, something that uh, we can achieve somehow on our own rather than recognizing that we're saved by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ himself and that now as those who have been redeemed by Christ, we must live in such a way that reflects his sacrifice for us, that, that we would reflect then uh, the wonders of his love in this world for others and help them as they come to know him as their savior also. Uh, this, uh, this particular passage in the Song of Psalms, it helps us remember God's passion for the church. Christ's expectation of uh, renewal and uh, restoration and the building up, the edification that we experience in this life through our mate, through our husband or our wife, and that that relationship would bring us closer to God and never ever turn us away from his love uh, for us and the desire he has for us to be with him for all eternity. <clears throat> and last tonight, let's look at uh, Song of Songs, chapter 8, uh, verses 5 through 7. <clears throat> Starting, actually, the second part of verse 5 is where I'm going to kick off at. It says, I woke you under the apple tree where your mother gave you birth, where in great pain she delivered you. Place me like a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm. For love is as strong as death. It's jealousy as enduring as the grave. Love flashes like fire, the brightest kind of flame. Love flashes like fire, the brightest kind of flame. Hear this uh, expression of what love is is really given even more plain to us. We sang it this morning in the greatest commands uh, from 1 Corinthians 13, isn't it? A description of what love really is, how love actually behaves. We say the word love sometimes so flippantly, somehow without realizing that, you know, 1 John 4, 8 says God is love. And so love is something to be uh, honored. Love is something to be uh, placed up on a pedestal to realize how precious and important it really is. Read along with me in 1 Corinthians 13. We'll start in verse 1. <clears throat> if I could speak all the languages of earth, and of angels, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clinging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains, but I didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful. Love is not proud or rude. Love doesn't demand on its own way. And love's not irritable. It keeps no record of being wrong. And it does not rejoice about injustice. Love rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up. Love never loses faith. It's always hopeful and it endures through every circumstance. Prophecy and speaking in unknown languages and special knowledge, they'll all become useless. But love will last forever. You know, as we watch that video and, and as they describe the fact of, of love uh, having an unending theme, uh, the truth that love goes on and on and on, and how the book ends with this open ending for us to recognize that love continues and it continually uh, rebuilds and reforms and remakes even in our own life that we might express love over and over in each season of our life as we, as we age. It's important to remember, <clears throat> not only is love teaching us about God's desire for us, but it's also to help us remember the second great command. Jesus said the greatest command, of course, is to love God with all of your being. But he said second like it is to love your neighbor as yourself. You know, life is best lived in love. For God, love above, for God above everything else, but, but love for one another just as he's commanded us. Over in 1 John uh, chapter 4, 1 John chapter 4, and we'll start in verse 7. Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, 
For love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God, but anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. love God showed how much He loved us by sending His one and only Son into the world so that we might, be, that we might have eternal life through Him. This is real love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us. And He sent His Son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and His love is brought to its full expression in us. Just think about that, that wording for a second. Love is brought to its full expression. Boy, I tell you, I'm shamed sometimes to think about the fact that the, the greatest love that, that Leanne will know in this life is the, the poor pitiful love that I try to express to her. He says, this is the full expression of love, to treat each other with this kindness, with this gentleness, with the intimacy and the devotion that God has given to his church. I know I fall so short. I recognize that all of us probably feel the same way. But what an ideal, what a goal to have in each of our lives to live in such a way that our spouse feels loved, knows love, and, and can enter into this world day in and day out seeing all of the temptations, all of the struggles, all of the sins that have engulfed so many around us and to stand strong in the love, in the support, in the spiritual renewal that they receive from a devoted husband or devoted wife. What a precious thing we have when we have love. God truly is love. I want to give you a challenge as you read tonight and, and the rest of this week to go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And as you read about love there to replace uh, the word love with your name. To replace the word love with your name. And to read through all the things that it says about love as if it's you. It's a very, very tough challenge. It's a tough challenge to say, I'm going to be patient. I'm going to be kind. I'm not going to give up. I'm going to forgive. These are the things that love calls us to do. And as we grow closer to Christ, these things become automatic. So now you've heard a sermon based completely on the Song of Solomon and uh, the, the deep desire, devotion that God has for us. Hebrew, uh, the Hebrew writer, he tells us that God has a jealous love for you. He wants you and he wants all of you. And he wants you to be devoted to him completely. And what a high calling it is for us to devote ourselves to Christ first and to live a life that then reflects his love to everyone that we come in contact with. Tonight, if you're here and you're not a Christian, we encourage you to become a Christian. Enter into this love of your Father, uh, the love that gave uh, a precious and wonderful Savior for you. One that could uh, uh, go through life sinless and die a, a death that would redeem every soul that's ever lived. His name's Jesus, and he's reaching out his hand to you, calling you to be with him for all eternity. He calls you his beloved if you are a Christian, but you're struggling, that's what we're here for, to encourage one another, to lift each other up. Whatever your need might be, come while we stand and we sing this song. And renew a right spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. And renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, O oh Lord. And take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. And renew a right spirit within me.